Dear friends, very welcome to the Gothenburg House of Literature and this online conversation with the Belarusian poet Julia Tsimafeyeva and uh, it's conducted by Stefan Ingvarsson from Swedish Pen. My name is Marit Kapla and uh, I'm one of the board members of Swedish Pen. And today's event is also uh, co in cooperation with uh, Writers' Center West. So, uh, we want to address the worrying uh, situation for literature, freedom, freedom of speech and democracy in Belarus. Uh, not least since the presidential election in August last year. We have invited the Belarusian poet Julia Tsimafeyeva, who wrote this book, um, Dagar i Belarus, is published in Swedish translation by Ida Börjel. And uh, this book is about the events in, in Minsk and other parts of Belarus uh, last fall. Uh, <clears throat> Julia, is, Julia Tsimafeyeva is attending online from Graz in Austria, where she is an artist in residence. And uh, the moderator of the conversation is Stefan Ingvarsson, who was formerly the cultural attaché of the Swedish embassy in Moscow, and who this spring is working through Swedish Pen uh, in order to support Belarusian writers in their struggle for freedom of speech. A warm welcome to you who are watching and to you, G Julia and Stefan. Privitanya Julia, where are you joining us from? Hi Stefan, uh, I'm joining you from Graz, Austria, uh, where, I'm uh, where I'm with my husband Dargen Baharevich, a writer as well. So we're here uh, at the Writer's Stipendium. Uh, on, we came on the invitation of Kulturvermittlung Steiermark, so organization that helps writers from all over the world. And how long have you been in Austria now? Uh, since the end of November, I'm here. So actually, when my book was written uh, and uh, was uh, given to the publisher, I came here. So the book, we, we know you here in Sweden from during this last year, Dagen i Belarus. It was written just before you actually uh, came to Graz. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that, that's true. Yeah, and that was... the book is dealing with... Uh, a very intense period in October. Uh, for those of us, for those listening right now who haven't read the book yet, can you say just a few words about this time period? Why did this time period become a diary? And, and uh, what, what, what did you catch in describing these days? You know, maybe then I, I have to tell uh, the the whole true story, maybe not a long uh, one, uh, about the appearance of that book, how it uh, was written. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the first part of the book was written for the uh, Britain newspaper Financial Times, and it was in English. It was the first part. It was called Diary, and in the first October, uh, and I wrote about the protest. And then uh, this uh, text was translated by Ida uh, Buriel uh, into Swedish language and appeared in Dagens Nyheter. And after that, uh, I'm very grateful to Patrick uh, Hadenius uh, from Norsted who addressed me and who uh, suggested uh, to publish a book, uh, the whole diary, if I had. And actually, I didn't have uh, any diary except that part uh, translated uh, into Swedish. Uh, but I thought that... Uh, I could write the one because uh, all the memories I had uh, about October events, even about August events, were so vivid and I, I mem uh, memorized them so clearly that uh, I could just write that diary at once and I started working at that. First I wanted to make it a bigger, uh, a bigger diary with August, September, October, uh, but then it uh, turned out that uh, Ida and me had uh, only around two weeks to do that job. And that's why I decided to write only October. So as I had the first part, then I started writing that. And so because that, you are, that, that's the way. Mm -hmm. You are a poet and you also write in this book that mm. from August, from when the demonstration started and the protest movement started around the elections, uh, you, you weren't able to write and express yourself as a poet. 
So what, what kind of text was this? Because so well, this, this felt possible to write, this diary form. Yeah, you know, uh, um, when, when the, the uh, protest after the election started and when we uh, saw all this violence, this brutality, I couldn't find the words to write about. I mean, artistic words. I, I could uh, just spread information to my foreign friends what was going on, but I could not write anything. And I'm happy that some uh, poets could do that. For example, Dmitry Strotsev, his book uh, has been translated into Swedish. Yeah, Andrei Hadanovic, Nastekuda. So I couldn't do that. And I felt maybe that, that this genre, uh, the genre that uh, Svetlana Alexey used and uh, uh, her teacher Alessia Damovich used. So they, they used these testimonies. Mm -hmm. This is the main genre. And uh, when, uh, when we got internet on the 12th of uh, uh, August, after, after, the shot, uh, uh, after it was uh, shut down, yeah, uh, people started writing uh, their impressions about all these days, about the violence or about the, how the elections were triggered and all the things. And I also did that and I felt... On social media, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean in Facebook mostly. Yeah, yeah. So I mean Facebook or, uh, yeah, and, and, and they were also in Telegram, they were in news uh, channels, these testimonies, and I thought that was the most important thing, to catch this historical moment and to put that into words because um, we could forget. But one of the, one of the uh, slogans, one of the chances, yeah, uh, never, forgi uh, never forget and never forgive, that was also... Uh, maybe one of the reasons why I also wrote that diary. And you were writing in English as well, or partly in English? No, I was writing completely in English. Completely in English. Yeah, and, and it was and it was also a, a thing that I could write that only in English. I could not uh, find Belarusian words for that. And uh, being uh, a kind of English language uh, writer made me that uh, gave me that opportunity to become someone else, to have that distance from from the uh, events that were happening, unbelievable events. Because yeah. this is also what made me curious that maybe explaining what happened inside Belarus was also more difficult than imagining an outside reader be it in Financial Times or in Sweden, who will re and the, the necessity to communicate with me as a Swedish reader, yeah. that this enabled yeah. something for you. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true also. This moment of a reader, though I didn't, uh, um, I didn't imagine any, I don't know, reader uh, special, but it was a kind of psychological uh, treatment for myself also to write that in words and to become someone else, but also to, uh, to uh, give opportunity to the West or to other countries to, to read that. By the way, uh, some, some days ago I had a talk, a long three-hour talk with the Gothenburg students, the students of Gothenburg University, and uh, they read my book and we were discussing that. And uh, that was, I also got that question about uh, readers. And there were some uh, students who were not uh, of Western descent, but of uh, Eastern descent. And they were speaking how important, from Iran, from Syria, how important uh, it was for them to read this book as well. And they wanted that to have in their own language. So it was not only for the Western reader, uh, it, it turned out, but also for the Eastern one. And it also was very interesting for me and impressive. Yeah. We are not going to quote uh, anything from the book right now, mostly because uh, it will be sent in, a, broadcasted in episodes by the Swedish radio between the 24th and the 28th of May. So all of our listeners who haven't read the book yet uh, have the opportunity to listen to your texts uh, in a short while here in Sweden. So I would like to go to the turn the page sort of and and move on to the to the very end of your book to the very end of your diary it ends with uh, the arrest of thousands of people and the prosecution of hundreds of people uh, we know that uh, the Belarusian regime rolled out a massive repression uh, on the Belarusian society how would you describe this winter and the spring I mean if, if you start where your diary ends? Well, there is a long story to tell, of course. Uh, uh, I, of course, I should mention uh, Raman Bandarenka's death. Uh, uh, he, he, uh, he was killed uh, on the, uh, in, in November. Uh, 
uh, more than a week after I uh, after my uh, diary ends. Uh, he was killed for um, preventing some strangers in, in, in the yard of his own home. It was in the so-called uh, Square of Changes. And uh, from preventing them from um, um, uh, putting away the ribbons, white and red ribbons that uh, the neighbor, the people from the neighborhood put there. And he was killed by an unknown man and no one knows what happened to him. And then there were um, huge demonstrations uh, and uh, there was a self-made memorial at that place. Yeah, but if, if we go further, uh, I would say that um, at the end of the winter and even in the middle of the winter before the new year, uh, the massive rally stopped though uh, because it has become very um, uh, unsafe to be outside, to go and to protest. People were arrested and they didn't see any, any point in that. But not I, not I, only I, arrested, but, but also met with, with, with the violence. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. and beaten and tortured and all these things. But so we don't have massive rallies at the moment, uh, but uh, we have smaller rallies, and at the same time, people get arrested. So, for example, in March, more than one hundred, uh, one more than one thousand people were detained, or in April, three hundred people with no with no um, rallies at all. So, and uh, also tortures are going on. Uh, of course, the West, uh, her and uh, other media, so uh, they were uh, reporting on the tortures in August. But even now they're going on. For example, today I've read news about people who were arrested in a bathhouse, uh, a dozen of people and uh, men uh, were on hunger strike. And uh, they were beaten five days in a row, and one person at the moment is missing, so no one knows where he is. He had problems with uh, his health. So it, it, it all goes on. And uh, uh, at the moment we have uh, three, uh, 370 political prisoners officially acknowledged, and more than 600 people are uh, imprisoned for political, on political grounds. And uh, we have firings of people uh, who were detained, even accidentally doctors, uh, teachers, even opera singers. Uh, and uh, that's that. And that's the world people. Uh, I mean, that's the reality people in Belarus live now. So but still, it, it was going yeah. on. Yeah. We will return mm -hmm. to this in. in, in in a while, of course, we want to know more about the situation right now. But this this development also coincides with you leaving Belarus for your scholarship. Mm. And you talked about the distance that uh, the, the English language created and writing for a kind of foreign uh, reader. But at the same time, now you have a very physical, tangible physical distance to Belarus and mm. to your hometown Minsk. How, what, how does this distance play in? Because you're mm. following everything now through friends and through media and social media. Uh, does this give a clearer picture, do you think? Um, well, I wouldn't say so, that it gives a clearer picture because, um, you know, maybe I, I'll tell you, were, maybe I don't know about emotions that I felt, yeah, because when, when I came here, uh, in the few months even, I felt guilty for not being there, uh, for not going out into the streets, and I was following the news. I even, I even had more uh, Telegram subscriptions to more uh, Telegram mass media, mass media in Telegram, you know, uh, just to follow this. And I think when it's I important here, just to say to our Swedish yeah, listeners so that Telegram is an app in the Russian-speaking world, uh, popular in the Russian-speaking world, and also in Belarus where you can follow a lot of channels and uh, it's kind of like uh, independent blogging, but also serious news reporting of all kinds that goes on in, inside Telegram. Yeah, and it was of, of, of much help for Belarusians when we had shut down of the internet in the first days after the elections. And even uh, uh, my, my father and my, and my husband's father started uh, following news on the Telegram using VPN, using proxy servers, so we are now we are just uh, masters in that kind of uh, thing. And uh, so continuing, I would say that I also felt 
uh, how abnormal the situation was in my country, that uh, I had to adopt to that uh, unbelievable things in order to survive, in order to keep my mind healthy as well. So in order to keep a psychological health. But now, uh, with, with time, of course, I adopted to, to this reality. And whilst following the news, uh, I'm following them every minute. So it's kind of addiction now. I would say that we are all addicted to news now in Belarus. Those who are following the situation in Belarus. So now I, 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 and I feel that's this duality being in between. So I'm here in Austria, uh, uh, in a free country, but at the same time, my mind is still there all the time. I'm following them. Reading the news, like um, uh, when I'm wake up in the morning, the first thing I do, I, t I take my telephone and read the news that there are because we have uh, one hour uh, difference. And so something could happen in Belarus already. At that but time. you are also yeah. sitting and writing right now. Yeah, I'm sitting and writing, and uh, I'm very grateful to Kultur Vermittler Steiermark that I got the opportunity to write the continuation of that book, to write that bigger version of the book that uh, I had an idea of. And here I wrote about August events using my uh, Telegram chats with friends, using my uh, photos. I, I made a lot of photos during the protest, and, and I also added March part, and the book is going to be published in Germany uh, at the end of the month, I hope. Yeah, and so what, yeah, what will be the German here. title? Uh, Minsk Tagebuch. So Minsk it will Tagebuch. be about Minsk. Mm. Yeah, it will be uh, Minsk Diary. Yeah. It will be. Yeah. You, uh, uh, how would you also answer the question? Because a lot of people say, well, Belarus has been a dictatorship for decades. Uh, there has been no freedom. There's been, a, there's been political prisoners before. How would you? Uh, answer this kind of, you know, um, question coming from from a Swedish person. Why is this year different? What 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 is really? I mean, last. <laughs> yeah, last year. Why is it different? Why why uh, Belarus has always been like this? There's never been any freedom. Yeah, of course the. Uh... We didn't have any freedom in previous years, and we also had protests after the presidential elections uh, in 2006 and 2010, and in 2010, almost all presidential candidates were arrested. Maybe uh, not, uh, not so many people remember about that, who are not following the news from Belarus, of course, but, uh, well, on the one hand, I have my version. Uh, and I've read a lot of other versions, of course, as well. Maybe one of the things is that people are ready for that already. So there is another generation of people who uh, went abroad, who saw another life, who lived in democratic countries, or at least they imagine how, how democracy should function and what it gives to the people. And on the other hand, and I, I think with the rest also, and maybe internet also changed our mind. We can't, so internet made it, uh, impossible for one person to keep uh, everything in, in uh, his hands. I mean, to be the one, to be the uh, source of power. Because everyone thinks now on the internet, everyone uh, can uh, express what they think. And uh, it also changed. But on the other hand, uh, there were, I mean, uh, also COVID is one of the reasons, of course, it changed the whole world, but also it changed uh, Belarus as well. For example, uh, um, when COVID came to Belarus in uh, February, it seems to me, I don't remember exactly, uh, last year, uh, Lukashenko was very disrespectful to the first victims of, uh, of uh, the infection, yeah, to, to, to the first people who died. And it, uh, and it was just uh, appalling for most of the people. And he said that the, all the world was uh, uh, laughing at his tractor and vodka recipe, yeah, to how to cure COVID. Uh, but people, uh, at that time, people understood how serious it was. And they started collecting money, uh, crowdfunding money for medical workers, for their clients, for masks and all these things. And they, mm, they felt that solidarity uh, and they felt uh, that they can manage without this uh, fully government, foolish government. So they can do that themselves. And why do they need that? I think that was also one of the reasons. And then, uh, and then we had uh, a, pres a new presidential 
candidates for presidential candidates and a long queues of people standing to sign uh, a document that allows them to, to be a candidate for candidate and all. I mean, Babarika, Tsipkala, and um, Tikhanovska and others. Yeah, so it started, I think, with that also. And we, uh, and those students realized how many of us are waiting for the changes, how, uh, how helpful we can to each other, how can we, how can, how much solidarity we can express toward the starting. Yeah, and I think that it also played its role. And, yeah. In, at the moment, right now, we're so focused on the repression and, uh, well, the, the human tragedy that's going on uh, for those in prison, tortured, beaten, uh, some forced into exile. Um, but there, there have been gains for Belarus as a society, uh, yeah. as a country. And uh, maybe now with almost uh, a year's perspective on what happened just after the elections, how would you sum up the gains, what would you say mm. have, has been won by Belarus mm. uh, during 2020? So uh, I've already said about solidarity. That's one of the most important things that we felt is important for us and uh, we can express it. So, uh, and another thing is that we believed in them, so, uh, ourselves, I mean, Belarusians. Uh, it was very important uh, because Lukashenko always uh, spoke about Belarusians that uh, he always told that Belarusians won't won't manage without him so he is the the one who gives us everything and so on and so forth but when uh, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, Maria Kalesnikova and Veronika Tsipkala went uh, onto the stage they were rock, like rock stars yeah uh, it was like a rock concert and uh, Maria was uh, shouting to the public you're incredible uh, like yes, in Russian. So, and the Russians believe that that we are incredible, and then we can do anything. And that's very important that we believe in ourselves. And uh, now uh, the Russians are going on. Uh, not only, of course, it's it's very hard for people in in Belarus, especially I think, uh, for those who are uh, in prisons or who are not in prisons as well. But uh, people are. Uh, still um, raising money for political prisoners and their families and for refugees. They are sending letters to prisons and it's also a kind of psychological self-help. So they are sending letters to prisons to support the prisoners, but at the same time they're uh, supporting themselves. There is a, a huge amount, a very massive Facebook uh, group where people are uh, sharing uh, the, the letters uh, they got, so the, the, uh, these messages from the prisoners, but also they're sharing uh, whom they wrote and all these things. So it's also very helpful for, for, for people to survive. Uh, but also, uh, uh, though uh, a lot of prisoners are not given that letters, it's also, I would say, kind of torture. So this deprivation of information and support that uh, political prisoners uh, feel in, uh, um, in jails. I would, but like, also, I would, I would like to return yeah. to the topic of, yeah. of letters. But if, if we're focusing also, let's, but, let's, let's keep the thought of, of some gains. Because we have so many yeah, yeah, sad yes. things to discuss. But Belarus was yeah. usually described as a, as a nation building process that wasn't totally completed, that, it, yeah. it's, that uh, compared to its neighbors in Ukraine, Russia, Lithuania, Poland, it didn't take all the steps into a national identity fully. Would you yeah. say that this last year has changed this? Well, of course I would, yeah. Uh, maybe not for, s okay, we should be positive. Okay, it, uh, <laughs> it gained a lot, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we had a kind of maybe, I can't say it's a revival, but something like that, because people got interest in the Belarusian language, in Belarusian literature, in Belarusian history. And uh, um, 
uh, and people started speaking Belarusian. And now uh, it's returning to letters. So people start, uh, I mean, prisoners and uh, those who write to the prisoners, they start using Belarusian language as the language of communication. It's also very important. And as Belarusian language has also uh, was a kind of mark for those on the other side. I mean, um, the police officers or something like that, or in the deten- uh, offices in the detention centers, as Belarusian uh, speaking people were even marked to be beaten more severely. It also, so it shows how it's important. So to keep that, like like a flag, it's also kind of your white and red flag. Belarusian language also has become like that. Yeah. I think many many of our listeners here in Sweden uh, are used to being a little wary of nationalism and national feelings. And then uh, at the same time, we have a movement that's uh, set very centered on national symbols, on the horse riding uh, symbol, historical symbol of Belarus, of the, the white red flag. Uh, mm. How would you address them if they say we we are this is a little worrying we see very strong nationalistic tendencies Mm. in ukraine is the same thing happening in belarus how would you describe this 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 feeling no i i don't think that's uh that's the same as um it also kind of opposition to lukashenko as lukashenko doesn't have any uh nationalistic idea behind his power just his power for a power there's there is no any idea behind his. Uh, uh, he has this word ideology so a lot, but there is no idea in that ideology. He say. created his own yeah. flag. It's the flag of Lukashenko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the flag of Lukashenko. But uh, coming back to the national things, you know, uh, during the protests um, uh, in August, in September, uh, there were no any. There were no any slogans against no one, not against Russia, not against Ukraine, nothing of that kind. Because I think it was like Belarusians uh, stood uh, in front of the window and saw themselves and believed in themselves. That was important for us to find that identity of ours, like, I don't know, like a teenager, so understands who he, he or she is. So it was like that, this kind of nationality. Yeah. So this kind of uh, national identity, identity, that was the main thing to, to understand how we are different from others, but also how, uh, how good we are and that no one, so, and we want to be neighbor, we want to be good neighbors with everyone. We're not going to have war with anyone. We do not have any aggression towards anyone, only towards uh, Lukashenko. That was, he who, who shall go. And yeah. the protest famously had almost only female faces and, uh, and yeah. a very strong female component. Uh, did this come about by chance or do you think that it expresses something deeper in this new generation that you talked about, this generation that has some kind of idea of an open and democratic society? You know, it, it's very complicated, a question for me as a woman, of course. And um, I like this idea of the uh, female face being the face of Belarusian protests. Though, of course, there were both women and men uh, who were fighting. And more, of course, more men are sitting in jails than, uh, than uh, women. That's true. But I think it also... To do, to do something with the Svetlana's personality, because... She, she became, and Maria and Veronika, of course, uh, they all became role models for women. And it became um, possible for women uh, to say something and, uh, and to be heard as well. And we remember how uh, uh, a few, I don't know, months or weeks before the elections, Lukashenko said that uh, Belarusian presidency is not for, for a woman. And it was so kind of, opposition, I think. And of course, it's, it's, it's beautiful uh, for media to use that image, of course, like, <laughs> let's be frank. It's, 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 it's beautiful. You have to have that uh, uh, women in, in white with flowers and yeah. But though, I, I, I would, I, but, but, though we still have problems with uh, feminism and female rights in Belarus as well, even uh, in this, uh, among those who are against Lukashenko. 
But it's something, last week I, I met with an uh, LGBT activist from Belarus here in, in, who was visiting Sweden, and he told me that the, the amazing thing with the protest movement was that earlier uh, questions of LGBT rights were often, even in the democratic opposition, treated as, well, this isn't the priority right now. Maybe this is just blurring. We, let's focus on, on the important things and then we will solve the questions of an open society. But he said that in the protest movement, the capital was uh, being fearless and being, being out in the street and no one would tell anyone to be silent. And, uh, and he made a case that this, that what was wonderful about the demonstrations was that everyone was allowed a voice in them. Uh, yeah. How would you react to this? Because it's, it gives a very beautiful image of, of, uh, of the solidarity that you talked about before. Yeah, 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 that's true. I agree. Uh, I, I, I didn't take part, uh, in, in, so I didn't have an opportunity to take part. But, but yeah, I saw this and I know about that. And uh, that uh, there were huge uh, LGBT car uh, uh, slogans, how to say, placards uh, with their message. And it, yeah, it was very important. And um, maybe that was also because uh, we feel that um, uh, with Lukashenko in power, we do not have any opportunity to develop. And we all need that change to develop. There is, I would say, there is a long way to go still, though we felt that solidarity was possible, yes. But it could change. I'm afraid that it could change. But uh, with Lukashenko, it can't change. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, when we change him, so then we can grow, we can develop further, we can work with that, we can speak, we can discuss, we can explain, we can work with that. And that's also very important, maybe that was also uh, felt at that time, though, of course, now it's impossible. Yeah. The protest I mean, has yeah. also a very cultural, uh, uh, physical appearance, because um, one of the things that I think few Swedes have understood is how much of a mass movement the, the protests were in terms of meeting your neighbors in your courtyard, improvised lectures, concerts, poetry readings, discussions. It, it was really like a kind of adult learning uh, uh, movement, something we can relate to here in Sweden. Uh, where you you just help you you taught each other things you 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 gave each other lectures on important topics. Uh, this what do you think is important with this with with this cultural and literary musical aspect of the protests? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. And as like I said about the Russian language, the Russian country and history, that it had a kind of. Uh, Revival, let's say, at least uh, uh, there were uh, there was and there is much interest towards Belarusian language, culture, history, and so on. It's very important, uh, but also uh, I would say music played uh, one of the greatest roles uh, even before the elections. Uh, Svetlana, Maria, and uh, uh, Veronika uh, were uh, had a special song uh, before they came to the stage. There was a song, and we all were listening to that song. And we know that was the symbol of protest. It was walls. Uh, the the song uh, used by uh, Solidarity Movement in Poland. Uh, translated into Russian and into Belarusian language, uh, but then also uh, Viktor Tsoy's Pirimian changes. Yeah, so this song, uh, it was also a kind of sign. You, you could hear it from a car going uh, along the street and you see, oh yeah, that's Pirimian and your heart was just warming up. Uh, and uh, um, of course, this Kupalinka song I write about in my book uh, that uh, protesters, uh, female and male protesters, uh, sang at the streets, uh, at the squares, uh, and Volny uh, Hor of Free Choir, who was gathering on the steps of uh, Philharmonic Hall at the first days of protest, and it was their um, expression of peaceful protest. First, they were with slow, with some placards, but then without, they were just singing songs. And I was also uh, uh, invited to write uh, to read a poem there. And then they came uh, when these uh, uh, meetings there um, of the choir became unsafe, they started singing in trading centers, in railway stations. So it was also very 
beautiful uh, action. Yeah, this also dancing. Uh, if we speak about even dancing, so Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem um, uh, uh, challenge it was called when people mm -hmm. in white and red were dancing on the snow, uh, on the sn uh, mm, on the snow, and uh, it was filmed. And uh, different uh, parts of Minsk, where different uh, small towns and cities had this video circulating on the internet and distributed uh, by mass media and telegr ch telegram channels. Mm. But yes. also we have this uh, uh, circle dancing case when in Brest, uh, one of the Belarusian biggest cities, uh, hundreds of people were uh, circle dancing and now uh, they're prosecuted for that and uh, dozens of people uh, were arrested and then uh, some of them were already uh, punished uh, for, for that by Belarusian court. Theatre also, we, we know this uh, Kupala, Kupala theater who had to fire because Pavel Latushka, now he's in a position uh, and used to be the director of the theater, he was fired, so they they followed his example in other theaters. We have not only one theater of that kind. And of course, literature. Yes, my uh, favorite literature. And I've told about my own uh, inability to write poems, but there were then... Dmitry Strotov, Andrei Khadunovich, Nastya Kudasova, Algert Bakharevich also wrote his uh, folk poem that, that circulated a lot, my husband. And also these poetry readings in the courtyards. And uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, oh, sorry, you mentioned uh, these lectures, uh, but also readings. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in, um, in uh, November, and it became unsafe to read because yeah. poets were arrested for that as well. And also amateur poetry. People are writing poetry in jails or to jails. They're writing poetry to be distributed by mass media. Maybe it's not, it's not of high quality, let's say, but it, it gives hope, it inspires, and I think still it's important. It, it um, um, gives people... In, uh, so it, um, it makes literature interesting for people and shows that it can help and it's... It's 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 worthy to to read. It's yeah. very it's very interesting when you mention this because there seems to be two uh, feelings towards the poetic language. Your initial reaction that you don't have a poetic language for what is happening, and then at the same time a, a mass movement of people who feel that they cannot describe this in their everyday language that they need to. Mm -hmm. Uh, find a poetic language, acquire some kind of poetic form to express mm. what they're feeling because it's because it's it's so far away from their everyday life and everyday the way they talk about things. Um, where are you now with 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 your attitude to your poetic language? Well, here in Graz, I. I was able to write poetry uh, about uh, violence and August events. I don't know whether they are also of high quality because sometimes you need that distance to, to write something um, really uh, painful or how to say really beautiful. And when you are too close, you can it can be a kind of can be a kind of um, uh, like newspaper style, something like that, you understand what I mean? Um, but I started writing poetry here again, yeah, so. And yeah. if you would describe the general, wh where we are now, I mean, uh, you said it became too dangerous to do the readings in November, then we've had, we have new arrests coming every day. Um, you're in contact with your friends and writing colleagues in, in Belarus right now. What, what is the atmosphere? Mm. Are people giving up? Or what, what's, how, how would you describe the feeling of, of your colleagues right now? Uh, I wouldn't say that people are giving up, no. no they just don't have a choice. So we can't give it up. Uh, but they uh, feel it to be... Um, this atmosphere to be quite suffocating um, with ideology everywhere. For example, my friends, musicians are telling that 
uh, ideological teacher uh, comes to a uh, music conservatory to speak on ideology. Uh, she has several lectures. So to the musicians, professional musicians, and uh, uh, and uh, people are always writing that uh, there are uh, red and white uh, flags everywhere, and they are painting everything with red and, uh, and I mean red and green. I mean this yeah. uh, official, uh, official colors. Flag, yeah. Yes, this official. Flag. So it, it's everywhere, and um, I would say that people are tired. Uh, Can and, I just uh, clarify when you speak about ideology? What, what do they talk about? I mean, loyalty to the state? What, what, what yeah. kind of ideology? Call, so, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I've, I've, um, I've never been to such uh, yeah. uh, lectures, so I can't say for sure, but I guess how important it is to, to keep uh, what we have now, not to ruin what we have now. So this stability that used to be Lukashenko's uh, main slogan in previous years is used now, but it doesn't work anymore. As uh, economy is, uh, is destroying all the time, so and uh, people see that they can't, they can't live here. So a lot of people are leaving the country. They're going to exile or they go because of some economical reasons as well. So, I mean, for example, IT specialists, IT um, programmers, they are leaving the country in, in masses. Yeah. yeah so but, but if we're talking about literature and publishing, do you have any concrete examples of yeah. how it, is it possible to publish your books right now? Is there an, a, a strong, con I mean, are the publishing houses very controlled? How would you describe the situation for literature and for the written word? Mm -hmm. During the years uh, when it was more or less possible to publish books, to have independent bookstores, uh, to have uh, uh, presentations there. So we had some several independent, so-called independent publishers. For example, Andrei Yanushkevich and uh, Kniha Zbor and uh, Lokvina and uh, Zmitsar Vishnev and others. And uh, in uh, January, for example, uh, two of them, so Kniha Zbor and Andrei Yanushkevich, uh, they uh, were interrogated by the official, officials. Um, their offices were searched. Their uh, technical appliance and computers were confiscated. Their uh, bank accounts uh, were blocked and are blocked at the moment. And uh, a few days ago, Andrei Yanushkevich asked for help uh, because he's facing uh, financial problems and uh, his publishing house can um, shut down uh, because, uh, because of another thing, another example. Uh, around a month ago, uh, the second edition of my husband's uh, Alger Baharevich's novel, Dogs of Europe, were uh, stopped at the border as uh, Andrei Yanushkevich printed them in Lithuania. So uh, Belarusian um, uh, border control stopped them, uh, stopped all these books that he had an idea to sell here and to get money. And they are going to, um, and they are uh, checking the book for extremism. So they are looking for extremism in that book. And uh, they didn't uh, manage to find it in a month, so they have prolonged that for 20 days more. Okay. And now we are waiting for what the result will be. And that's why Andrei Yushkevich couldn't sell this book so very, uh, because it, 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 uh, he, mm, he expected uh, this book to be a bestseller, but then nothing. And now he's uh, asking for help for... His, so this uh, little window of, of independent publishing and book selling is, is yes. closing. Yes, and it's, it's closing for uh, in all uh, cultural spheres, in uh, artistic field, as uh, artistic uh, exhibitions are closing on political grounds, also music. Musicians have their problems. Uh, uh, several months ago, um, uh, people who came to a musical concert, all of them were arrested, including the, music, uh, the, the group, the band. And they had to go to exile to Ukraine, for example, I mean, uh, music band. So everywhere. Yeah, and it, it's it's very suffocating, I would say, and it's impossible to develop in such a situation when we have uh, only military people uh, going uh, in in the streets and controlling everything. You you can't you can't uh, in order to create, you have to be free. 
there is no, uh, I don't know how many drops of freedom uh, is left, uh, are left in Belarus, I don't know. You, uh, you use the term surplus of democracy in your book that they, uh, they felt... It was ironical. Kind of, yeah, I know, it's, it was like an ironical term that the authorities felt that there was a surplus of democracy in the Belarusian society and it needed to be closed. Yeah. And what we see now is the closing of this minuscule surplus that existed. Uh, Julia, my final question, the role of the outside world, what does it mean to those who are still resisting in Belarus, to those who are in prison? What can we do and how, what role does it play if we act and react? Mm. You know, uh, I'm, I'm often asked that question. It's also, uh, it, and it's very complicated to answer that. Uh, and I say that maybe first of all is spreading the information, speaking about uh, what is going uh, going on in Belarus right now, as uh, it's not, there are no so beautiful, so beautiful pictures of uh, women in white or of, I don't know, smiling, uh, massive uh, protests and all the things. Uh, maybe another thing is uh, to persuade the business that works in your country is to stop cooperating with the dictator and to finance uh, these repressions, of course. And, uh, to, and not to forget, maybe, what has been done, because in previous years, uh, after the presidential elections, when we had all these protests and we had all these repressions and beatings and uh, arrests of presidential candidates, it was more or less forgotten yeah, by the, by the Western politicians, I would say. So now, please do not forget and do not forgive, I would say. And do not believe in the dictator. So do not believe him. He's lying all the time and no truth would be. So do not forget and do not forgive. And I'm very thankful for this talk, Julia, and for your openness with us today. And uh, I would like to remind everyone listening who reads in Swedish that Dagarna i Belarus is available uh, in bookstores and that uh, a recording of Dagarna i Belarus with the Swedish act actress Stina Ekblad will be available in the Swedish radio at the end of May from the 24th to the 28th. So please listen or read uh, Julia's uh, diary because this account is very much a foundation and understanding of what's going on and how the developments have have uh, turned out in Belarus during this year. I, um, I just want to thank you and uh, how long are you staying in Austria now? Well, I don't know. We'll see what it will be. So I'm staying for half a year, but we'll see what there will be. We hope to hear more from you, Julia. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak up. Thank you.